Welcome, friends. Here we are, the second week of Esther, and the plot is thickening in Esther chapter 3. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We need your help. Uh, we want to engage with you. We want to know you. We want to love you better through your word. Please walk step by step with us through the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, let's go ahead and read. I'm on page 66 of the workbook. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had commanded, had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. All right, lots of questions, friends. Uh, but let's start with some easy ones that we can answer for sure. The who in this passage. All right, we see right off the bat, we have King Ahasuerus, right? And we have Haman, the Agagite. Don't know where he came from, but here King Ahasuerus has done what? Uh, the, the narrator tells us several things. Number one, he promotes Haman. Uh, he's, uh, this word promote means to make great. Uh, so he's making him great in importance. Number two, he advances him. Uh, this means to exalt him. Number three, he sets his throne above all the other officials. All right. And when I looked at this, um, well, well, number one is to set. I mean, that means to fix it. It this is conclusive. Haman has this position. He has a throne, and this is a throne usually known as a monarch's throne, a king's throne. So he has elevated Haman the uh, Agathite, Ag Agagite uh, to a very, very high position. And then last of all, we learn a little bit further down that, uh, where does it say? Well, it's just in verse two. Uh, he commands his servants to bow down, to pay homage to Haman. We learn that in verse two. He, it, it's interesting. I asked the question, why must the king command that uh, that people bow down, pay homage to Haman? Is he not a respectable man? Is it that no one wants to bow down to him and so he must make this command? I don't know. Curious minds want to know, right? All right, so we have King Ahasuerus, we have Haman, and then we have Mordecai and the king's servants, right? And so what happens next? Well, the narrator explains to us that Mordecai does not bow down. He does not follow the king's command. And the other servants around Mordecai take notice. You know, Mordecai, why, why aren't you following the king's command? Uh, and, and all the narrator tells us is that Mordecai does not listen to them. Uh, where is that? I'm sorry. Verse 4. And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not, this is Mordecai, would not listen to them. He would not take, take heed and he would not respond in conformity with all of the other servants or with the king's command, right? 
And so what do they do? I mean, don't you, don't you love a tattletale? Right, so they go and tell. They make known to Haman that Mordecai is refusing to bow down to him. And it's interesting, isn't it? Like, this has happened evidently day after day. We don't know how much time has gone by. Uh, Haman's never noticed this. They have to point it out to him that Mordecai is refusing to bow down. And so now Haman takes notice and it says he is filled with fury. Uh, he is full. He is full of intense anger. And so he vows then, like he, he's holding back. He could have, um, he could have he could have, he had the power to do something to Mordecai right then and there, but no, he's going to notch it up. He finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, and so he is going to seek to destroy all the Jews. That's the last verse here. So, as they had made known to him, the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So Mordecai's decision to not bow down, Mordecai's civil, I'm going to call it civil disobedience, right? He's not following the king's command, uh, has implications not for himself alone, but now for all of his people. And so this stirs up a lot of questions, right? Uh, the big question is why? Mordecai, why? Why aren't you bowing down? It's not clearly answered here, is it? No, I don't think it's clearly answered. Why does Mordecai not bow down to Haman? Um, and, and, you know, yeah, is this right? Is this right of Mordecai, this civil disobedience? Now, there is a cross-reference to Daniel, but the cross-reference is uh, Haman's being filled with fury. The cross-reference is found in Daniel chapter 3, verse 19, where we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar and the gods that King Nebuchadnezzar, these images that he had set before them, they refused. They also uh, disrespected, but they were disrespecting the king himself, and they were refusing to bow down before these other gods. Now, uh, that civil disobedience to me, that seems a little bit different than Mordecai's, right? Mordecai had obviously, he's assimilated into the Persian culture. He had bowed down to the king himself. He's been following all the rules all of his life up until now. So why, why doesn't he bow down? And, you know, I did some digging. Uh, the only, you know, I'm just asking questions really at this point. This may be one of those places in scripture where we're not going to get a satisfying answer. But I wonder if there's a clue in verse one, Haman the Agagite. All right, Haman the Agagite. So I just, I, I wrote that down in my keyword column and I found out that an Agagite is a descendant of Agag. Uh, synonymous for Amalekites. And we know that Amalekites were enemies of the Jews, okay? Um, it goes all the way back. Okay, uh, Agag can be, number one, if you look this up in a Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia, we're going to find Agag is the name of, of an Amalekite king. It may just be kind of a title like the Egyptian word Pharaoh is. Uh, but we also know that the Amalekites had attacked the Israelites in the wilderness and they were cursed by God. So this is found in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. Check it out. Uh, God was so angry with the Amalekites and he vows that he will destroy them. So there's that piece. And then the other thing that we know about the Amalekites and uh, a, a king named Agag uh, is that uh, Samuel 
had commanded Saul, God had told Samuel to send King Saul to wipe out the Amalekites. Like this is generations later and God is going to fulfill his promise. So King Saul is to go out, destroy the Amalekites and to kill King Agag. Did he do it? No, he did. He went out, he conquered the people, but he did not destroy everything down to the last sheep as God commanded. And so, uh, you know, is this related in any way to this enmity between Jews and the Amalekites? Is this in any way related to the disobedience that goes all the way back to Saul? I'm just asking Chris questions, friends. I don't have all the answers today. Just a lot of questions. So to wrap this up for today, uh, let's understand what the main point is because sometimes it's not satisfying when we don't get all of our questions answered in Bible study. What's the main point of this passage? Well, Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman who now seeks not just to destroy Mordecai, but to destroy uh, all of Mordecai's people. Everyone is to be, all of the Jews are to be destroyed and Haman is going to get to work on this. So then I was like, Lord, how in the world, like what's the spiritual lesson for today, right? What is that spiritual lesson? And here's what I came up with, friends, as far as an application goes. My choices affect others, right? Uh, we see Mordecai's choice here affects others, whether his choice is right or wrong or a combination of the two. Um, maybe it has a right side, maybe it has a wrong side, and maybe this could be debated like there's no right or wrong answer here. Either way, his choice affected others. It affects his family. It affects his people. Friends, the same is true for us us, our choices, our personal, uh, Carmen's personal choices today will have implications on my family and will have implications. I bear the name of Christ, right? As a Christian, I bear his name. And so my choices have implications for all of us. We all do. So, you know, my prayer is, 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 is Lord, help us to trust you and to obey you and to follow you and you alone. And would you please pour out wisdom as we make choices in our thoughts, in our words, and our actions today.